Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. The headlines. At least one person is injured as Russian air defenses shoot down four missiles over Belgorod. Wagner founder confesses situation in Bakhmut is very tough as Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky claims more than 1,100 Russians are dead in less than a week. And plus, China's Premier Li Kang accuses the United States of encirclement and suppression. At least one person was injured in Russia's southern Belgorod region bordering Ukraine after air defenses shot down four missiles. The governor of the region, Vacheslav Gladkov, said, quote, our air defense systems were activated in Belgorod and Belgorod Oblast. Four missiles were shot down. The extent of the damage on the ground is being clarified, but one person is already known to be wounded. An ambulance team has been dispatched to the site. Authorities in Belgorod, which borders Ukraine's Kharkiv region, have reported multiple attacks since Russia began the full-scale invasion of its neighbor last year. Meanwhile, a close ally of the Russian President Vladimir Putin and head of Russian mercenary group of Wagner, Yevgeny Prigozhin, says that the situation in Bakhmut is very tough. In an audio statement released by his press service, Mr. Prigozhin said that the closer his fighters get to the center of the city, the harder the fighting becomes and that more artillery and tanks target his soldiers. Mr. Prigozhin said, quote, the Ukrainians throw in endless reserves, but we're advancing and we will continue to advance. Mr. Prigozhin explained uh, that the members of the Russian army helped his troops with ammunition, adding that there, were no, there was no conflict between the Wagner fighters and Russian troops. Earlier in an interview, the mercenary chief had expressed ambitions to turn his private military company into an army with an ideology that would fight for justice within Russia. And Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says Russian forces suffered more than 1,100 dead in less than a week of battles near the eastern Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, the focal point of fighting in eastern Ukraine. Speaking during his usual nightly address, Mr. Zelensky said Russian forces had sustained 1,500 sanitary losses, adding that dozens of pieces of enemy equipment were also destroyed. In less than a week, starting from March 6, we managed to kill more than 1,100 enemy soldiers in Bakhmut sector alone. Furthermore, at least 1,500 more enemy sanitary losses, those whose wounds are incompatible with continuing the fight, plus dozens of units of enemy equipment were destroyed, plus more than 10,000 Russian ammunition depots were burned down. Today, I bestowed the title of a hero of Ukraine on soldier Oleksandra Matievsky, a man that all Ukraine will know, a man who will be forever remembered for his bravery. And residential areas in the Russian-controlled Ukrainian city of Donetsk have been hit by shelling with Russian-installed officials blaming the strike on Ukraine. According to the Russian-backed mayor of Donetsk, Alexei Kulimzin, the city was shelled four times with MLRS rockets. Several residential areas were affected and power lines damaged as a result. Mr. Kimlezin uh, had blamed Ukrainian artillery for the attack, but there was no immediate Ukrainian response. And Western tanks will significantly change the war tactics in Ukraine. That's according to a Leonard Koda, a seasoned Ukrainian tank brigade commander who received the Hero of Ukraine award less than a month after Russia's full-scale invasion. Mr. Koda expects the deployment of Western tanks to give Ukraine significant advantages on the battlefield. He said Western tanks have higher firing range, and if the equipment is used properly, one can destroy the enemy before the enemy approaches its firing range. Kiev has secured pledges from Western nations to supply modern battlefield tanks to help fend off Russian forces. Mr. Cordes says no other way for the war to end but with Russia's capitulation and the payment of reparations. 
and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says she agreed with President Joe Biden during a meeting at the White House to have a dialogue concerning incentives to the clean technology industry. Mrs. von der Leyen said the European Union welcomes the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act because it provides a massive investment in the green energy transition. The two leaders met against the backdrop of European complaints that clean energy subsidies in the United States, Inflation Reduction Act, and others will divert investments away from Europe and hurt their economies. We welcome the Inflation Reduction Act because it is a massive investment in the green transition, moving towards a net zero economy. We agreed that we will work on critical raw materials that have been um, sourced or processed in the European Union and to give them the access to the American market as if they were sourced in the American market. We agreed on a transparency dialogue concerning the incentives that are giving to, uh, given to the clean tech industry. For us, it's important on both sides of the Atlantic to know uh, what kind of incentives are being given to the clean tech industry to make sure that we join forces to boost the clean tech industry that is crucial and paramount uh, for reaching a circular economy, a net zero economy. And the war in Ukraine was also a major agenda item at the meeting with U.S. President Joe Biden and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Speaking in the Oval Office at the start of the meeting, both Mr. Biden and Mr. V uh, Mrs. von der Leyen underlined the strength of their partnership, their unified support for Ukraine and efforts to hold Russia accountable for its invasion. Elsewhere, new Chinese Premier Li Kang has begun his first ever press conference taking questions from foreign and domestic reporters based in Beijing. Mr. Li was inevitably asked about relations with the United States during the press conference. After prefacing his comments by saying it was an issue that had already been discussed by Foreign Minister King Gang and that he did not want to go into details, he then seemed to have a rather a lot to say. He first noted that Mr. Xi and U.S. President Joe Biden had reached a consensus during their meeting last November and that needed to be transformed into actual policies and concrete actions. But as he called for more cooperation, he also criticized the United States. Mr. Lee said, quote, China and the United States should cooperate and must cooperate. When China and the U.S. work together, there is much we can achieve, adding that encirclement and suppression are not advantageous to anyone. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says an extra five billion pounds will be spent to replenish ammunition stocks and fund the next phase of a submarine pact with the United States and Australia in an update to Britain's foreign policy framework. The unveiling of the updated integrated review has been choreographed to coincide with Mr. Sunak's visit to San Diego, California to agree the next steps in a landmark defense agreement AUKUS with the United States and well, Australia. Mr. Sunak is under pressure at home to offer more help to the Defense Ministry to combat the impact of inflation and spore production of ammunition and other military hardware to replace weapons sent to Ukraine to help Kiev push back Russian forces. But it's clear that the world has become more volatile, the threats to our security have increased, and that's why we're investing £5 billion more in our well-beating armed forces over the next two years and increasing our defence spending to 2.5% of GDP so we can continue to be a world leader when it comes to defence and keep our country safe. Well, I understand the concern that people have got around what's going on with Silicon Valley Bank. That's why I've been working with the Chancellor all weekend and indeed on the plane flight over to talking to the Bank of England and our regulators about finding the best solution. Uh, the, the government will have more to say on this very soon, but what I want to reassure people is that we will continue to support our well-beating tech sector and all the high-class jobs that, it's, uh, that it provides, but also that our financial system is resilient. As it, Richard Sharp was appointed by a government before my time, before I was Prime Minister, through a rigorous process. Now that process is being reviewed again by an independent, uh, someone who's been appointed independently. It's right that that process uh, lets, uh, you know, f finishes its course. It wouldn't be right for me to speculate before sure, then.
British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak talking on a wide range of subjects, but most importantly, uh, the AUKUS Pact. Let's talk now to Chidi Wano, security expert uh, in the British capital, uh, even though Mr. Sunak is in San Diego, California uh, at this point. Good morning to you, Chidi. Nice to have you with us. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Uh, let's, let's start with the AUKUS Pact, which is uh, the main reason why uh, Mr. Sunak is in uh, San Diego, California, in the United States. Uh, how important is this pact? Uh, and is it limited, do you think, uh, to submarines? Because that's what we've been hearing. Well, I mean, AUKUS is important from uh, a strategic framework for the United Kingdom in particular. <clears throat> it's, its main kind of, uh, I would say, relevance from our perspective is, 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 uh, is kind of cementing our relationship with the United States, making sure that we are, as we like to call it here, the partner of choice for the United States, and um, also ensuring that you know, our defense industry is still at the cutting edge of you know, these technologies. So the United Kingdom, despite its, its failings in many other forms of uh, defense, uh, manufacturing defense procurement like tanks, artillery, et cetera, um, still makes very good submarines, and these submarines are coveted around the world. Now, the interesting thing will be whether the Australians go for an American submarine built in Britain or a British-designed submarine built in Britain and partly in Australia. And I think that's partly what uh, Richard Sunak will be kind of uh, pitching for, to put our submarines as, um, as the Australian's choice with some American technology. It will be good for British industry, and it will be good, again, from a strategic point of view, making sure that Britain has a foot in, in the door in the Indo-Pacific with Australia and the United States. So whilst we, but again, sorry to expand on your question, whether other things will be involved, that again is a very good question. We, we can't, we'll know at the end of this discussion. Um, the United Kingdom's contribution to the Indo-Pacific, such as it is, will be mainly naval. And uh, in order to make that contribution, we've created uh, two uh, um, aircraft carriers, two new aircraft carriers uh, and carrier battle groups. Again, we have many problems with these carrier battle groups. One of the carriers is broken down. Uh, and we don't have enough ships to form the, the protection for these carriers, or enough aircraft, or enough pilots for the aircraft. There's a lot of there, there's a lot of issues in the in the British military, but that at least is Britain's statement of intent that we're able to contribute to any kind of defence situation in the Indo-Pacific. Now, with AUKUS building on that, we'll see whether it means um, the UK will now be able will be looking to contribute to ground forces or artillery or missiles, which is unlikely. But again. If there is a call or an ask for that, it's likely that the United Kingdom would, would say yes, because anything that makes sure that they are lockstep with the United States is, is key for British, um, for British uh, uh, defense strategy. Now, uh, submarines, of course, uh, have played uh, not too much of a prominent role uh, in uh, the invasion of Ukraine so far. Um, I don't know, maybe tomorrow that could change. But Submarines are very expensive, highly uh, 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 difficult to maintain. Very few countries have them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was reading yesterday that uh, Australia, if this deal goes through, will become only the seventh country in the world uh, uh, to have nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, the others, of course, are the usual suspects, including uh, Britain and the United States, Russia, China, uh, France, and so on. Uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, is this dynamic being driven uh, by what is going on in Ukraine and the fact that we're having to, or they're having to, uh, rely on these other countries I've mentioned uh, for the military hardware, because most of the countries uh, in the world don't have this? Well, I think the, um, <clears throat> submarines thus far, you know, uh, have been because most of the wars of the past uh, of the late 20th century to early 21st century have all been ground wars and the big wars have been ground wars in landlocked countries or you know non-coastal countries in asia so the the involvement of submarines has been mostly limited to um firing um, you know cruise missiles again which is what the russians are using their submarines for in ukraine firing cruise missiles you know to attack land targets if not being used in their classic sense of interdicting shipping you know on the high seas now the, when it comes down to AUKUS, I, I think actually the, the war in Ukraine is a massive distraction from um, what AUKUS was supposed to be about. Because if you go back all the way to the Obama uh, kind of presidency, the United States was pivoting very heavily. I mean, it was called the Great Pivot or the Pivot onto the Indo-Pacific, acknowledging that 
uh, China was going to be the great competitor or adversary of the next of this century, and ensuring that the United States was not only able to compete economically, so they had the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as a kind of economic framework or the economic NATO, if you would, if you would, to confront China. And then they've had, you know, what was, you know, the Five Eyes and all of this kind of stuff building up to. Um, you know, AUKUS, which was which is to confront China militarily, and then build a network of alliances with actual with Asian countries um, to to ensure that they're able to confront China as well. Um, what this AUKUS will mean is that Australia has exactly the same defence policy as as the United Kingdom. So the United Kingdom, post Second World War, once with the loss of the empire, and especially after the war in Suez in 1956, the United Kingdom realised that it no longer had the military or economic power to confront challenges around the world. So it always needed to be allied with the United States. So our defense policy has gone from, you know, being the power that ruled the waves, you know, uh, pre-Second World War to being, you know, um, you know, uh, to, to, be, to be a little bit crude. Uh, you, you, the America's sidekick, you know, going everywhere with them whenever they want to fight a war. So this is why the United Kingdom was in Iraq and Afghanistan, not because our strategic interests were challenged, but because we needed to demonstrate to the Americans that we were their main ally. Now, the, same, the Australians have the same issue. Because of where they are, they know that if to confront their, their great challenges, in the old days it was Japan, now it's uh, China, they need an ally. In the old days, their ally was Britain. Britain obviously doesn't have that economic uh, military power anymore, so it's now the United States. So Australia needs this deal as much as uh, maybe the Americans need this deal in order to have you know, an ally in the region. It's, it's Australia's way of cementing their alliance with the United uh, States, United Kingdom acting as that kind of glue, bringing them all together and being able to project, their, the Australians being now able to project a much greater power than they'd be able to generate themselves. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, um, kind of developing their abilities for some, uh, to, uh, for, with submarine warfare, uh, the problem with these technologies like submarines and carriers is not just the platforms themselves. As you said, the platforms, the carriers, the submarines are very, very, very expensive. The training the crew is very, very, very expensive, but it's not just that, it's, it's developing the skills. You know, fighting a carrier is completely different from fighting, you know, a normal warship. Fighting a submarine is completely different from fighting a normal warship. And in order to, to develop those skills and also to keep them in your Navy, so you've got to understand, like, every, every year people are leaving the military and taking their skills with them. If you don't have submarines, uh, those people with skills, you know, to fight and maintain a submarine are leaving. Uh, and uh, you're losing that, that big skill set. So the Australians, again, part of this is to keep that skill set, that knowledge base uh, within their country. Uh, same with, as I said, so if they're choosing a British ship, uh, a British submarine that will be manufactured in Australia, what it means is they're keeping part of that technology, they're keeping part of that knowledge base, and in order to, to kind of future-proof themselves against any other you know, eventualities. Now, uh, we, we are actually looking at a picture of a submarine that... Uh, I, I wish uh, our producers would put that back on. We are looking at a, a, a submarine there, and um, perhaps my next question would be, you did mention it in your answer to the first question where you talked about, you know, the situation with the British carriers and uh, the fact that one of them, you know, uh, uh, already broke down, which speaks to the fact that over the years, uh, the British system has suffered a bit in terms of funding. But now, uh, Rishi Sunak, in this uh, defense review, there's the submarine I was talking about, uh, in this review has promised uh, five billion pounds. Uh, now, that could sound like a lot of money, but from the little I know uh, of defense, uh, once that goes in, uh, it's not too much, is it? And uh, is it going to make much of a difference to the situation on ground? Uh, you're right. It's, uh, in terms of defense budgets, five billion pounds is, is like that biscuit money. That's not really something that's going to, um, you know, make a, a massive difference. It, it could, if used wisely, if used properly, with targeted schemes. The problem is that, I mean, when I, uh, there's a phrase that I use sometimes when I'm uh, describing the British Army. I say sometimes the British military is like the Nigerian Army with good packaging. It's, it, there's, there's so much dysfunction uh, within the system uh, that it's creating a lot of problems. So we've talked, you know, in the past about the Challenger 2s, about the Warriors, about uh, the AS-90s, these artillery pieces. They're all good pieces of kits, but they're all decades old. And if you go back and you read the defense reviews that, you know, I'm old enough to have read, you know, been through several cycles of defense reviews where it's projected that we're going to have this, we're going to have that, we're going to have this, and it's not happened. We're still using those same tanks, those same artillery pieces from decades ago, simply because there's so much dysfunction in the system. Defense procurement in the United Kingdom 
is I mean I wouldn't say it is it's vastly corrupt but it's very bureaucratic and it's very it's very convoluted so we should have replaced a lot of our vehicles a long time ago but we haven't because the new vehicles have been developed and you know this it takes so long to make a decision every new government and every new person wants to make a different decision or add to it and in the end you've still got the same vehicles and they're not working uh, as well as they should now yep. the polls the polls have expanded go on. their Please military go on. Uh, over the past few de years by buying, you know, equipment just off the shelf and then having it, you know, buying uh, items and then bringing it into Poland. United Kingdom, because of our, our very convoluted system, we're not going to do that. We're most likely still going to go for looking for some bespoke system that doesn't, that, you know, we're never going to be able to get on the ground in time. And the, so the final point is, again, as I alluded to about the carriers and the submarines, personnel. The British Army has downsized repeatedly throughout the years, you know, from the days from Afghanistan to now, we cut our troops down to below 80,000. Uh, and the ones that are remaining, most of them are highly not necessarily well motivated because, you know, the army is no longer what it used to be. So the, what needs to happen in defense is not just, you know, putting a load of cash in and, and using that as an announcement. There needs to be a, a whole kind of conceptual change, a whole culture change, moving away from, uh, you know, cutting the army to accepting that we need to be able to fight land wars independently, not just depend on the Americans, and also change our, our organization. I mean, I could go into how our division is, or divisions are organized and all of that, but there needs to be a massive cultural change, you know, all the way from the top. Uh, you know, the bottom levels are great. You know, the, the officers, the, the young soldiers are all good. It's the senior level, you need to have a culture change and just understand that it's not about waving big, you know, words of cash and saying, you know, we've got this money. It's about changing the military completely to going back to doing what we used to do really, really, really well, which was fight wars. Go out, fight wars, beat people and, and win. And we've completely moved away from that. Now, more broadly speaking, I can't let you go without asking this because, I mean, the big elephant in the room when all of this is being done, the Americans, the Australians, the British and so on, as you alluded to a, a bit earlier, is China. And China is developing, is building up its capacity at a furious pace. Um, talk about aircraft carriers. Um, I mean, China's Navy is now the world's biggest, uh, since we've been talking about submarines. Uh, China's Navy is now the world's biggest. And uh, probably they're aping uh, the US and Britain in supply of fighter jets and all of that a lot of their fighter jets look like uh, american and british fighter jets uh, and probably have a lot of the same technology so broadly speaking uh, at the pace that the chinese are growing uh, when you put that side by side with the pace that the british for example are growing or the americans are growing and you have the contention in the room that there is going to be confrontation at some point whether it's over Taiwan or it's over South Korea or it's over uh, uh, any of the other flashpoints. Do you think all of this is working towards that confrontation? Um, yeah, ooh, very big question. But uh, I think the, the, the key thing is I think no, none of the, no, no party, be it the U.S., the, U, uh, the Chinese, or, even, or the Taiwanese, or the South Koreans, or maybe even the North Koreans, nobody actually wants this war. So if it does happen, it will happen by, by a mistake or by somebody doing something so stupid that nobody can back down. Everybody knows that this war will be completely destructive and it will cost everybody. But the second point of that is that everyone knows that if you do not show the other side that you are ready for this war, you're, <laughs> you're most likely going to start the war. So everyone is it's a very childish... Uh, escalatory pattern where everybody needs to keep showing they're tougher than the, than the next in order to make sure you know nobody comes and attacks them but you know in terms of being leading up to you know this big conf conflagration if it ever comes we've got to understand this there's two competing narratives the first is quantity and quality and I've alluded to quality already in this in that it's it's not about just having carriers it's not about just having submarines it's not about having 20,000 tanks the Russians have shown that you can have all of this equipment and not be able to use it properly the Chinese have a lot of equipment, but they have absolutely no conventional military experience over the past almost, you know, 100 years. So whatever they, whatever they go to war now, they're going to war as completely brand new with no combat experience. You've got to understand the Russians have combat experience and still, didn't, and still haven't been able to perform adequately. So whilst China has this huge, terrifying military and can do a lot of damage, without combat experience, it's got the first few days are going to be very shocking to them. 
they'll realize a lot of things because how fast they can adapt to changes on the battlefield that will determine and also how fast they can replenish losses that will determine their success but the counter to that is that again as we've seen in ukraine quantity has a quality of all, all of its own so just having tens of thousands of tanks just as we've seen in bakhmut by being able to throw lots of men and lots of tanks at a problem maybe eight months later <laughs> you might capture half of what you're going on. but you know it, it, it might not be great but it's, it's working if something is really terrible and it's working it, it, it's still a, a, an advantage in some way so it's those competing narratives between the quality and the quantity of the Chinese threat, you know, that, that, that is trying to be, uh, that, that you can see people trying to counter. And the Western um, kind of strategy is to counter it with quality, well-trained, well-equipped troops. But as we've alluded to, you know, in this conversation, we don't actually have that. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see what happens, uh, you know, if we ever get to that point, which hopefully we don't. Indeed, uh, Chidi One, we will be back on this subject uh, because I want to take you down uh, uh, this subject in a lot more detail. Our uh, time doesn't permit that today, but we will take a look at this because this is strategic, uh, even for the Ukrainian conflict. How all of this is panning out uh, behind the side uh, or on the sidelines will be critical uh, to how the Ukrainian conflict ends. Uh, whether it ends on the negotiating table or it ends uh, in military uh, defeat for one side or, or, or the other. But as always, thank you uh, for your time this morning. Thank you. Lord. After the break, Amnesty slams Aramco for a surplus amassed by crisis, including Ukraine's war. Details about in a moment. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. Amnesty International has criticized Saudi Aramco's record profits, which the company said totaled $161.1 billion last year. Agnes Akalaman, Secretary General of Amnesty International, said in a statement which partly reads, it is shocking for a company to make a profit of more than $160 billion in a single year through the sale of fossil fuels, the single largest driver of the climate crisis. It is all the more shocking because this surplus was amassed during a global cost of living crisis and aided by the increase in energy prices resulting from Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Saudi Aramco, a mostly state-owned energy giant and the world's second most valuable company behind Apple, said in a filing with the Saudi stock market that the net income for 2022 was up 46% from $110 billion in 2021. Let's talk now to uh, retired Navy Commodore uh, Kunle or Laomi, of course, who is now head of the Department of Criminology and Security Studies at Christland University in Abeokuta. Dr. Laomi, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, let, let's, uh, let me take off from where I stopped with my last guest, and uh, that, that's talking about strategy and how the war in Ukraine has brought certain things uh, quickly to the front. Uh, than they would have uh, if that had not happened. Let's start off with the uh, massive military buildup that is going on in several places, uh, uh, particularly in China, uh, in South Korea, in Taiwan, in Japan, and so on. Do you think we've started, for example, a new arms race? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's beyond uh, arms arms race. Uh, what we're seeing really in international security environment uh, is basically a realignment, a realignment of allies and um, preparation for what I'm beginning to consider as inevitable. Um, maybe, uh, so the the situation and, uh, where you talk about realignment. Let me let me ask you. I'm sorry to cut in. When you talk about realignment, are you talking about, for example, Russia, China, North Korea, uh, Iran, and so on on one side, and then you have uh, the U.S., uh, the U.K., uh, France, Germany, and a couple of others on the other side? 
Exactly. Uh, that's what is uh, playing out. Um, the events in um, Ukraine actually has uh, uh, provoked a uh, certain realignment. You, you can see, uh, for, for instance, Saudi Arabia aligning with Iran. And that, that's something that is surprising. And uh, you see the Brazilians, South Africa, also realigning with uh, the BRICS. So um, I think what they're doing is jostling for position and try to um, gather more allies, you know, on both sides uh, for what they consider an inevitable economic war and uh, perhaps, you know, um, a showdown uh, on the military uh, uh, aspect. Because uh, one of the important things in war is uh, your allies, you know, how many allies do you have? So if you see what has been going on, um, I believe that the, the beneficiary of all this is going to be China. Um, I said earlier on in the program here that um, this uh, is like a distraction of what I call it in, in a chess game, uh, what I consider um, a gambit game. I think the ultimate is Taiwan. Um, the Chinese, you know, are very resilient and they are very determined to take uh, uh, Taiwan. So whatever they can do with the Ukrainian programs as it's going on now, aligning with North Korea, uh, the Russia, uh, Iran, and so on, uh, is going to play out eventually in an ine inevitable attack on, uh, on Taiwan. So the United States, they know this, the British, they know this. And that's why you can see them try to take the Pacific, you know, uh, getting uh, countries like Australia, Japan, um, South Korea, you know, into the basket. So um, this is not a very good sign. It's not a very good sign. Um, I said in the other program, that, uh, the last program I did on TV, that um, uh, the, the Russians cannot be uh, underrated that they've not actually used most of their modern weapons. Uh, yesterday, they started showing what they have, uh, dropping a 1,500-pound bomb on a target. Uh, it, 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 it's like uh, using hammer to kill mosquitoes. And firing some of their uh, hypersonic missiles and so on uh, from the submarines, from the aircraft and so on, is just to show uh, the West, uh, what they still have in stock. And I saw the British Prime Minister also trying to align, you know, sub submarine deal with the United States, you know, to help them in Australia as well. And uh, floating a five million pounds, you know, budget on, on defense by the British, uh, I think it's also an indication that they're preparing for a larger battle. Let's, uh, let, let's look at how all of this could possibly play out. I mean, because when we're talking about this, uh, we, we, we are looking at it from the angle of security. My last guest uh, uh, earlier on talked about the fact that this confrontation, even though it sounds inevitable, is not wanted by any of the parties because they know that in all probability nobody is going to come out of it. But that it's likely to start off by somebody making a mistake somewhere in all of this furious uh, uh, building and uh, uh, arming uh, that is going on. Do you agree? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, the last time I mentioned that uh, Putin is, is a psychopath, he's a, somebody who knows exactly what he's doing. What he's doing basically is punishing Ukrainians and it's going to wear them out completely. You know, you can imagine how many uh, men and uh, materials have been lost you know, in this battle. But while doing that, um, you can see the Chinese are also supporting. And I think uh, the United States is not very uh, happy with Chinese, uh, with the Chinese. And um, I, I just think uh, if North Korea is dragged into this, what you just uh, predicted might may happen. The little rocket man, as is on the call, may trigger a world war by making mistakes. Because I see him as somebody that is not very stable. I does not understand the international security environment. And when you look at international relations, you can see that North Korea has been completely sidelined, except with maybe China, uh, maybe Iran. So they actually do not understand how some of these games are played. And if they are drawn in, 
Um, I, I, I'm thinking that North Korea may be the trigger of um, the Third World War. So a mistake can be made. And um, when you put people like Iran in the basket as well, imagine if Iran uh, decides to attack Israel today. What will happen? So um, I think the international community, the United Nations, should uh, call some of these boys to order. I call them boys, the P5 and actually try to tell them that these uh, are necessary uh, programs they are backing on. As I said in the other program, they are making a lot of money from this. But beyond that, what you really mentioned can happen. We can have a situation where somebody will mistakenly, you know, uh, press a button. And I like to, as I usually do, uh, predict or advise that uh, this war is not going to be won on the ground. Um, I'm sure that somehow along the line, um, somebody may decide to take out Putin, and I think we will have uh, some respite in some of this agitation that I'm seeing all over the world. The alignment and realignment is not in the interest of anybody. Um, we have more pressing needs, you know, the economic is not very good. I mean, the economy is not very good globally. And uh, the issue of health is more paramount than all these uh, submarines and aircraft carriers that they are spending billions and billions on. Uh, the world deserves better. And I think some of these uh, warmongers and the uh, military industrial complex should see beyond, you know, uh, fighting and uh, destruction. Um, I, I, I pray that there be no mistakes from the North Korea. Now, uh, uh, before I let you go, I must ask, of course, uh, when you talk about people being sidelined, many uh, that I've spoken to on this program have pointed out that Africa is one of the regions that appears to be completely sidelined in this uh, uh, battle of taking sides, uh, particularly in terms of the military buildup and preparation for, you know, confrontation, if, uh, if, if that is the word. Um, what can or should African countries do while everybody else seems to be pre making preparations? Because as you pointed out, uh, almost everybody else in Asia, in Europe, uh, in the Americas, uh, are, are, are making their own preparations for one thing or the other uh, so that they're, you know, they're prepared when this happens, if it happens. But that doesn't seem to be the case in, you know, on our own continent here. We're not, we not seen to be preparing. Am I wrong? Yeah, we have nothing to prepare. Um, we have more pressing challenges, you know, uh, democratic, you know, challenges. Uh, we have economic challenges, food, uh, even power. So um, even if we want to prepare, I don't see, uh, are we going to get loans from China again to prepare for a war? Um, I think America, Africans should just remain on a line. Uh, I believe that the South Africans are uh, biting more than they can shoot. Uh, I don't understand what South Africa really have that's making them to um, jump on, on, on the train. Uh, Africa should maintain its non-aligned uh, movement and perhaps use the African Union to um, press in terms of a diplomatic uh, shuttle and try to uh, prevail on the, uh, the, warring, uh, the warriors or the, the, the warmongers uh, at the UN Security Council at the uh, National uh, the, uh, Assembly. I think what they can do basically is uh, diplomacy and, and not to prepare for any, any form of war. What, what Africa needs now is uh, good governance. Uh, what we really need right now is um, food. And uh, what we need now is energy. Uh, I don't think we should uh, follow the trail and try to pretend that we have something to offer. Uh, the level of advancement and technology in the world, uh, I think Africa is far behind. And I think we should maintain a non-aligned posture at this point. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Kunle Olaume, uh, head of Department of Criminology and Security Studies, retired Navy Commodore, thank you so much for your time on the program this morning. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. When we return, ancient stone axe and swords intercepted by U.S. returned to Ukraine. Details in a moment. Please stay on with us.
Thanks for staying tuned. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says uh, the conversation with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on the sidelines of the G20 foreign ministers meeting in India last week was, quote, constructive, but that he heard nothing new from the United States side. Speaking in a televised interview, Mr. Lavrov said the pair spoke for about 10 minutes and discussed nuclear arms issues and the conflict in Ukraine. It was the first meeting between the pair since Russia sent troops into Ukraine last February. We spoke constructively without emotions. We shook hands when we met and when we said goodbye. It was a normal conversation. I don't know how well it reflects the understanding by the U.S. of the abnormity when they cut off all of the communication channels. But to speak like human beings on the sidelines of some event has never been some kind of a sensation. Everything I heard was a position that has already been expressed and underlined in public many times before. I gave my honest, detailed assessment, especially about the New START Treaty and why we saw it necessary to suspend detailed assessment of the New START Treaty and our fourth step to suspend it was thoroughly given by President Putin in his message to the Federal Assembly. So there's nothing new here either. Sergei Lavrov there in a very rare uh, 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 public interview. Let's talk now to Laddie Williams about the business coming uh, out of this. Um, Laddie, welcome. Good morning. Uh, brand new week. Yes, brand new week. <laughs> and But things from last week are reverberating. Still weighing heavily. Very heavily. <laughs> I see here the Silicon Valley Bank, the collapse of yep. it, which uh, Prime Minister Sunak of Britain was talking about there because the contagion seems to be spreading. Yeah. But everyone seems to think that what's going to happen is going to hinge on whether or not the Feds raise rates. Exactly. So, yeah, we know with uh, everyone was rattled over the weekend uh, from last week, uh, Wednesday, right. you know, when uh, the Silicon Valley Bank, you know, got that information that they were trying to get liquidity you know, in the market. And we saw how People you know, quickly VCs, rushed there and exactly. exited with all their Just funds. from advice from some venture capitalists, you know, to some startups that you need to go get your funds out of Silicon Valley Bank. That it looks like something is happening there. to happen. And they did that, and we saw that bank run was massive, massive, uh, about $40 billion, you know, pulled out at that time. Just, just over 48 hours. Uh, just over 48 hours. So it was, it, was, it was a big one. And at the end of the day, what happened with SVB was that they made some bets on some bonds there. And um, with the rate hikes we've seen, we know the relationship between rate hikes and bonds. It's right. inverse. So with the rate hikes rising, we saw bond prices you know, start going down. And they did buy a lot of bonds. Right. And they had to sell you know, for at, at a, at a, at a heavy discount, discount, heavy discount. You know, at a loss for them. So all of that you know, impacted on their liquidity. And we saw that bank run. And at the end of the day, we're seeing some analysts blame this on, you know, the interest rate hikes we've seen from the U.S. Which, Fed. Which came from as, inflation, from which came from the war in Ukraine. Ukraine. So we <laughs> see that domino effect already happening there. So at the end of the day, there's some stability now, you know, with uh, the U.S., and the FDIC, the FDIC coming you know, out and saying, look, you know all what? insured deposits, don't worry about it today, don't worry you'll about have it. access to your money. You have access to your money. And you know, some uh, industry professionals here are, some, are saying that some start, Nigerian startups have also been affected by this. Yes, because indeed. We know that um, uh, Silicon Valley Bank invested in some startups here in Nigeria. So those funds, they'll find it hard to, to, to get, get those funds. To particularly if, if they're not insured. Yes, if they don't get that money. So it's, it's a big one. But at the end of the day, everyone is watching. What's the Fed going to do next? Are hmm. they going to keep raising rates? So another reason, to keep, another reason to keep a very close eye yeah. on, on the Fed rates. Exactly. Indeed. Now, the dollar fell sharply this morning. Yeah. Is, is that related to this? Oh, yes. Heavily related to that because uh, we know how... Uh, rate hikes impact, you know, the U.S. dollar and how that took the U.S. dollar to new highs in 2022, about 114 points against a basket of six other currencies. Six, yeah. So we've seen that plummet, you know, uh, to that 100 level, 100 point level, but it's back to 105. Then we saw it come down again because now analysts and uh, investors are expecting that the U.S. Fed is going to calm down with those rate hikes, and that will in, uh, impact, impact the U.S. Course. dollar. Right. So we're already seeing, you know, the uh, U.S. dollar bulls and bears are already playing to that sound of 
is what is going to happen going to raise going rates to or this? not so we're seeing the u.s dollar react to that going down uh this morning about 0 0.55 percent how are global markets reacting to that bank collapse this dollar plunge it was a bloodbath last week you know when they got that news uh, late wednesday we saw uh, U.S. markets hit heavily from the uh, Nasdaq to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, S&P 500 hit hard. Bitcoin, that dropped below $20,000. We saw fear in the market for the first time in months. Uh, Asia wasn't left out. Europe, mar European markets, all of them rattled last week. But this morning, because of what we're seeing, you know, with the uh, indications that the U.S. Fed might, you know, <laughs> raining, just, yeah, raining the the rate, hikes, yeah. rate hikes. We're seeing the markets, you know, the U.S. Um, uh, futures markets, I saw it up about 1.8% for the NASDAQ, the S&P. So investors are already betting that uh, there might be a pivot, and we're seeing markets react to that today. Bitcoin back above $22,000. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's a risky bet because... We've seen the U.S. Fed say that as long as inflation stays elevated, they'll keep raising rates. So let's see if uh, <laughs> what's happening inflation with... Inflation stays elevated and they keep to the promise of raising rates. If they care if what's happening keeps... with SVB, that's another... <laughs> Indeed, Ladi, interesting times. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep a close eye on that. Uh, we trust you for that. Yeah. Uh, Ladi and uh, the team, of course, uh, uh, Business Morning and Business Incorporated. Business Morning right after this. Exactly. So join Ladi and his team for that. Finally on the program, a stone axe and three ancient swords reported to be of Ukrainian origin were returned to Ukraine at a ceremony in the country's embassy in Washington, D.C. The director of field operations in the New York office of the Department of Homeland Security, Frank Russo, says the artifacts were intercepted in July of 2022 at the John uh, Kennedy Airport a mail facility. Mr. Russo says the stone axe is determined to be from about 3,500 BC and the swords are from between the 11th and 13th centuries. Ukraine's ambassador to the U.S., Oksana Makarova, says the return of the items sent a strong message to Russia that it can not win. With the help of uh, Homeland Security Investigations and our National Targeting Center, that we were able to identify these items in July of 2022. These items were intercepted at the JFK mail facility, which processes 60% of all international mail. The stone is um, uh, determined to be about uh, from 3500 BC. It's, it's a very old stone. Uh, the swords are from uh, the 11th to, to 13th century. Uh, the individual who, uh, you know, it, was trying to import these items is, is known uh, to the government as somebody who, who looks to do this on, on a reoccurring basis. And, and it is with the help of Homeland Security Investigations and our National Targeting Center that we were able to identify these items as a result of that importer. The work that we've done, our teams together and with the Ministry of Culture and Information, uh, was successful to establish the Ukrainian origin and to prove that it really belongs to Ukraine and after we will be sending them back home there will be more research done and by returning this home uh, we believe that we also will send a very strong resounding message that Russians will not able to win this time they will not able to win us on the battlefield they will not able to win us on any other field and they will not be able to steal our culture from us and that's our package this morning. Thanks for being with us. My name is Ladi Akiri Dolwale. There are updates within the world today. That's at 5 o'clock and throughout the day. Do join us uh, for that. But for now, do have yourselves a pleasant Monday ahead. Good morning. <laughs>